newsletter, which you can do on the European School site. And it would be nice if you can support the work of the school by making a donation because we are a not-for-profit platform and almost everything we do is offered free of charge. Now, we'll start off with the books. And if you care to look at Juliet's screen, she will be brandishing a copy of this wonderful new book, which the school has published called Practical Vegetarian Cookery, the first vegetarian cookbook to be published in California way back in 1897. And it was by that associate of Madame Blavatsky's, uh, Countess Wackmeister and Kate Buffington Davis. And I'm told it has many, many delicious recipes in it. Um, perhaps uh, less savory is my own attempt at a little bit of self-publicity for my book, Everyone's Book of the Dead, which um, has been published this week. So if you want to um, get a copy of that, I'll put uh, the details of the website into the chat box. So let me tell you about one or two other things we're doing. Uh, the next event will be next Saturday afternoon, um, not next Saturday afternoon, on the 28th um, of uh, uh, this month, we'll be doing the latest uh, version of the um, Healing Circle, which has been organized by Juliet. And uh, so that's on the 28th. And if you'd like to participate in that or wish to include someone's name in the healing book, you can send us an email at eustheosophy at gmail.com. Now, we've got various other events coming up, which I'll try to remind you of in the uh, right order. Next Saturday, we have the third of seven talks by uh, Ravi Ravindra, and this will be on the yoga of action. Um, next Sunday, a week today, we'll be welcoming Keith uh, Pritzker, who's with us today, and he'll be talking about the secret doctrine, a timeless guide to self-discovery. And the week after that, we'll be welcoming uh, back Tim Boyd, the international president of the Theosophical Society, who will be talking about the practice of inspiration. So as always, the way that we'll conduct today's meeting is that we'll mute your microphones, which we've probably done already, and you'll, you won't be able to unmute yourself um, until after the seminar. So if you'd like to write a question in the chat box, you can do it that way, or you can raise your hand in the participants box. So this afternoon, we're very honored uh, to welcome Tom Bree, who will be speaking on the geometry of nature and cosmos, divine mind made manifest. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Tom. He's a, a geometer artist, a teacher and a writer. He studied the practice of sacred geometry at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts under Professor Keith Critchlow between 2001 and 2003. He since taught classes in practical geometry and philosophy at the Prince's School, as well as for many other organizations and institutes, both in the UK, where he lives, but also internationally too. And for the past 10 years, Tom has been analyzing the underlying design of the first English Gothic cathedral in relation to the quadrivial arts of geometry, cosmology, musical ratios, and arithmetic. He's soon to publish a long-awaited book on the subject this year, which will demonstrate the importance of cosmic myth and the ascent of the soul within medieval Christian ideas. The book will also contain a detailed description of the design theory itself that embodies the mythos. So uh, welcome, Tom, and uh, the word is now with you. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the, to the talk I'm about to give. I've uh, become used to giving talks on Zoom now over the last half year or so because of our current situation. Um, now, I'll th I think I'll just get straight down to the, the slides because um, what uh, we tend to, uh, the way we tend to look at the art with geometry is that the art speaks for itself. So I'll share my screen straight away and get down to the slides.
Now, Tim, is that coming up clear? Have you got the front panel? Yes, it is. Great, thank you. Now, I'll talk a bit more about, um, well, these two images that you can see in front of you right now. I'll talk a bit more about them as we go through the talk. But uh, I'd like to begin with a quote from Hildegard of Bingen, the um, 11th century Christian mystic from uh, the region that's now Germany. Now, this is one of her illuminations. Um, she had visions and her um, visions would be painted by artists. She'd describe them and they'd be painted. Now, this is from uh, Hildegard's writings. The firmament has a revolving orbit, an imitation of the power of God, which has neither beginning nor end. Just as no one can see where the encircling wheel begins or ends. For the throne of God is God's eternity in which God alone sits. And all the living sparks are rays of God's splendor just as the rays of the sun proceed from the sun itself. And how could God be known to be life, except through the living things which glorify God, since the creatures which praise God's glory have come from God? The divine mind is forever contemplating the eternal forms of number. In this image of God, the creator, the right hand is up in the orb of the divine wisdom, whereas the left hand is pointing the dividers down towards the earth. And so the divine wisdom, the knowledge of number, becomes manifest through the geometry that's brought about by the sacred geometer. Flowers are one of the great examples of seeing how geometry functions within the wider cosmos. Flowers always grow according to some sort of numerical pattern. Even going down to the molecular structure or the smaller size, you see the same kinds of geometries and of course up to the astronomical size as well, as we'll shortly see. For Hermes Trismegistus, the cosmos is an image of God. The cosmos is God's image and since God is good, the cosmos also is good. The movement of the cosmos itself consists of a twofold working. Life is infused into the cosmos from without by eternity and the cosmos infuses life into all things that are within it, distributing all things according to fixed and determined relations of number and time. Now, geometry begins with the circle, and the circle 
is an image of unity, an image of the one, because it has one single center and every part of the circumference is equidistant from that one single point. So every time a circle is drawn, there is an exclamation of the one. Now, much like geometry, each new day also begins with a circle or with the emergence of a circle of light, which reveals the whole world to us. So how beautiful it is that the part of us that does the viewing of this circle of light is itself also circular. The Islamic mystic Al Halaj once said, I saw my Lord with the eye of my heart, and I said, Who art thou? And he said, Thou. When you look at uh, more modern scientific images of the retina, and the sun, there is a rather striking likeness between them, which naturally brings to mind uh, this quote by uh, the philosopher Plotinus about beauty. Never did I see the sun unless it had first become sun-like. And never can the soul have vision of the first unless it first be beautiful. Geometry that has fivefold symmetry is generally the most common geometry that you find in the world of flowers. So, for instance, what you're looking at here is um, a hollyhock with the sun shining through it from behind and so showing up the pentagram star that naturally appears within it. Now, fiveness really is the number of flowers. <laughs> Now, sometimes a five-fold form in a flower will actually pretty much embody its geometric archetype. So, for instance, this one uh, looks much like a pentagon. Now, going back to that hollyhock that we just looked at, the way in which a pentagram shows itself within a pentagon, the, fi the re five-fold regular polygon, is like this, by drawing in the diagonal lines of the pentagon. Now, the thing about this particular type of geometric symmetry is that it embodies uh, something known as a golden ratio, which you may have come across before in, uh, other, um, in other situations. Now, the thing about the pentagon and the pentagram star, if you say that the edge of the pentagon is one, then each one of those lines that forms the pentagram star is what would be called the golden number. So it's a relationship of one to 1.618, roughly speaking. Now also, if you were to look at the smaller pentagon within the middle of that star and look upon that edge length as being one, then the point of the star, this line here, would be 1.618 in relation to this. So if this is one, this is 1.618, whereas if this is one, this is 1.618. And this golden ratio relationship is of a particular relationship between a smaller part and a larger part. 
Now, I won't go into more detail than that for now, but it's a very particular relationship and one that you find a lot in the world of organic growth. Now, this idea of a lesser and a greater relationship or a relationship between a lesser part and a greater part is something that you also see in what are known as Fibonacci numbers. And Fibonacci numbers show themselves throughout the world of natural growth, including in um, spiral patterns such as this. Now, I'll describe the Fibonacci numbers in case you haven't come across them before. You begin with the number one. Now, what you have to do is add each number to the number that comes before it. Now, of course, there is nothing before one, so we need to write one for a second time. Now, the difference between the second number one and the first number one is that that second number one has something to relate to other than itself. The first number one is just the one itself, whereas the second number one, as you could say, is like a reflection of the first number one. So together they make two, and then two plus one is three, three plus two is five, five plus three is eight, and so on. So the bold numbers in the upper rows there, they are, uh, that, that's, that's the Fibonacci sequence. Now, the thing that gives um, what's known as the golden number or um, the, the numbers that you can see below there in the italics, they come from um, the division of one number by the number that comes before it. So if we look at the first two number ones, one divided by one is one, two divided by one is two. But from now on, every single relationship uh, that we calculate will be between one and two. But more to the point, it will gradually move closer and closer towards the golden number which is 1.618033 to an indefinite number of decimal places. It goes on and on. So three divided by two is 1.5. And now when we get to five divided by three, we have the golden number to one decimal place. So it's 1.666. Eight over five remains as 1.6. 13 over eight, 1.625. And now when we get to 21 over 13, it then becomes the golden number to two decimal places. Now this carries on whereby we, it keeps on inclining towards this ideal relationship. And so in that sense, you can say that each pair of numbers here roughly reflect the lesser to the greater relationship of the golden ratio. It's not perfect. You can't actually ever get the pure golden number because that is something which is it's described as irrational. It's without ratio. So it can't be understood through a relationship between rational numbers. But what these Fibonacci numbers do is give uh, um, close approximations of this lesser to greater relationship. And these numbers are found throughout the world of growth. So let's go back to our seed head on a daisy. And of course, if we think of the seed head, it's a thing which holds uh, the, the regenerative potential of uh, our flower. Now, what I'm gonna do is count in on one of these spirals going in this direction but then I'm gonna count out on one of the spirals that's going in the opposite direction. So if I begin from here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So I'm gonna begin from that one and count out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that gives, you see the numbers up there, eight and 13, two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Now this type of spiral, you find it on lots and lots of different things. You find it three-dimensionally, for instance, on a pineapple, but you also find it in the positioning of the eyes on a peacock's fan. So it's a very, very common spiral that's found in the natural world. And it's all based on these approximations of the golden ratio. So both through that golden spiral, but also through five-fold symmetry, you see this golden ratio occurring in the natural world. Now let's move from down here on earth up into the heavens with the same five-fold pattern as what we're just looking at there. Now this is what's known as the Venus pentagram. Uh, this particular version of the diagram is taken from a, a geocentric perspective. So earth is still and fixed at the center. So what you need to imagine is that you're floating above planet earth as earth goes around the sun. And so earth appears to be still. Now the white line that's curving around and creating that five-fold pattern um, is the path of Venus, planet Venus, around the Earth over the course of an eight-year cycle. 
Now, if you looked from a, a Venus centric perspective, so if you had Venus fixed at the center, then the white curving line would be the way that Earth moves around Venus. So there's naturally this relationship of fivefold symmetry between Earth and Venus. Now, the reason for this is because the orbital periods of Earth in relation to Venus is a very close approximation of the golden ratio. So inevitably, because you have circular movement around the sun, according with the golden ratio, then inevitably you get this fivefold symmetrical relationship. Now this particular diagram, um, which like the last one is taken from a book called uh, The Little Book of Coincidence, which is uh, by uh, John Martineau, who also studied at uh, Prince's School uh, where I teach. Now this particular version of the Venus pentagram diagram is looked at from a heliocentric perspective. So the sun is there at the center and then the two concentric circles are the orbital circles of Venus and Earth. Now, if you draw a line between their relative positions once every few days, you can see how this sort of spirograph type pattern begins to develop because Venus is moving around the sun faster than Earth. Now, if you keep on drawing this pattern for eight Earth years, then you end up with this. So in this sense, Venus is the rose of the heavens. And the type of fivefold symmetry that you see with planet Venus in her movements with the Earth is also present with the fivefold flowers, such as uh, the wild rose, the dog rose that has its five petals. Now I'll try and make this a bit clearer. Um, it's actually whenever Earth and Venus have an inferior conjunction, if you mark those points where the inferior conjunction happens, uh, and the inferior conjunction is of course a straight line between Earth, Venus and Sun. So because Venus is moving faster, periodically Venus catches up and passes by Earth. And when doing that, obviously it makes a straight line between Earth, Venus and the Sun. Now this happens every 1.6 years. So there you have uh, an approximation of the golden ratio again, 1.6. So let's say that they begin from here. Earth is in the outer circle, Venus is the green one in the inner circle. Uh, after 1.6 years, they'll be here. So we can draw a line from where they were to where they now are. After another 1.6 years, they conjunct here. And so we can draw another line. Now another 1.6 years, like so, and you can see that line in the middle and it's beginning to turn into a geometric star. So another 1.6 years, and then finally, after another 1.6 years, it ends up back pretty much where it started, but not quite. And it creates that pentagram. So there is this natural geometric relationship that happens both up in the heavens as well as down here on Earth. Now, the reason why this happens is because it's very close approximations indeed of Fibonacci numbers. It's actually closer to Fibonacci numbers than to the golden ratio itself. And the numbers involved are five, eight, and 13. So five, of course, is the geometric symmetry that's brought about, but it takes eight Earth years to occur. Now, if we look at 13 divided by eight, as you can see, it's 1.625, which is one of the approximations of the golden ratio. Now, if we look at the orbital period of Earth, which of course is 365 and a quarter days, and we divide it by the amount of our Earth days that are in Venus's orbital period, which is 224.7, it gives something virtually identical to 13 over 8. So this is why you have this natural five-fold relationship between Earth and Venus. So 8 Earth years is 2,922 days whereas 13 Venus years is 2,921 and a bit days. So less than a day of discrepancy in that relationship. Now, if we talk about 
the symbolic idea of God the Creator as being a geometer, then we can see that the other person who was depicted in medieval Europe with the tools of the geometer was the master mason. And so in this sense, the master mason is emulating the creator in the act of creation by bringing forth a cathedral that's built according to geometry and cosmology. The master mason is thereby creating an image of the cosmos, a mini image of the cosmos. And so rather than seeing everything that's going on up above in the heavens, it becomes possible for the human to actually enter into the heavenly abode down here on the earth. Now the talk that I'm gonna give in a few weeks time is specifically about the details of the mythology of ascent that happens in the first English Gothic cathedral. But I'll show you just a few quick examples of this cathedral, just to um, give you a few sort of details of what I'll look at in, uh, in, with more complexity in a few weeks time. Now the cathedral in question, it's in a uh, very small city, the smallest city in England, in fact, it's the city of Wells. And the cathedral was built or it started to be built in the 1170s. Now, the thing that first got me interested about the ground plan of the cathedral is that the east end of the whole cathedral is pentagonal. So you have this fivefold symmetry that you associate with natural growth, as well as with the planet Venus in that actual shape at the east end of the building. Now, the planet Venus comes into the symbolism of Christianity uh, with both the Virgin Mary, but also with the risen Christ. So the Virgin Mary is known as morning star. And the symbolism is such that before the sun rises, you can see Venus as the morning star above the horizon, and she reflects the light of the sun down to us here on earth. And so in that sense, the Virgin Mary, who is associated with being the queen of heaven, she has the direct face-to-face -face relationship with the light of the sun, and she reflects that light down to people on earth. So that's part of the symbolism of the morning star with the Virgin Mary. But going back to a much earlier date, the morning star is also associated with the risen Christ. And this seems to be associated with the really ancient myth of Venus, whereby Venus descends in the west and then goes down into the underworld, but then rises up in the east as the bright morning star. And this is then associated with the death and a rebirth or a death and a resurrection. So Christ also describes himself as the bright morning star um, at the end of the book of Revelation, at the end of the, the New Testament. So up at the east end of the cathedral here, we have this lady chapel, which as I'll show you, actually has the geometry within it relating to the planet Venus. And so in this sense, the east end of the cathedral appears to symbolize resurrection. Now, when we turn this pentagon into a full pentagram star, you can see how the middle axis of the pentagram star, of course, naturally follows the middle axis of the whole cathedral, but the legs of the pentagram, they naturally bring about the central axes of the side aisles, which go down on either side of the cathedral. Now the arms of the pentagram, as you can see, they give the measure of the middle axis of those transepts, which are on either side. So what you have here between the dotted lines, um, a shorter distance between these two and a longer distance between these two uh, is 1 to 1.618, the golden ratio again. Now what you're looking at here is from um, the, um, the lodge room of uh, a group called co-Freemasonry. You may have heard of them. They're theosophical Freemasons. Now, the actual thing that you're looking at is actually gold in color, but you know how when you take photos of gold uh, colored things, it sometimes comes out as black. So it's gold and it's a pentagram shaped light. Now, this is what you have at the east end of a lodge room, uh, a Freemason lodge room. You have a pentagram shaped light and it becomes illuminated when the initiate has the experience of the symbolic resurrection in the third degree. It's up at the east end of the lodge room, directly above where the worshipful master sits, and he himself or she is an image of the rising sun. And so directly above is then the morning star. So you can see here. So this uh, association 
of a pentagram at the east end of a building which has an association with resurrection is something that you can see both in a medieval cathedral uh, and then has come into uh, the layout of a Freemason lodge room. Now, another thing that I'll, I'll briefly mention when I give this talk about Wales Cathedral in a few weeks' time is that the choir here, this choir area, the heart of the cathedral, is the same shape and dimensions as the Temple of Solomon. Now, something that's very interesting about this from a perspective of 12th century Christianity, because of course this was the time of the Crusades and when there was a Crusader kingdom, uh, the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Now what happened on the Temple Mount in the Kingdom of Jerusalem to the two buildings, these two Islamic buildings, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque was known as the Temple of Solomon. That's the name that it was given by the Crusader community. And it's where the Knights Templar were actually based and so hence the name that the temple has got. Now immediately to the north of the Temple of Solomon was the Dome of the Rock, the octagonal uh, Islamic uh, shrine, but it was made into a church and it was called the Temple of the Lord. So you have the Temple of Solomon to the south, the Temple of the, uh, the Lord to the north. Now if we look at our image of Wales Cathedral, which of course was designed at the time of the Crusader Kingdom, you have the Temple of Solomon as the choir, and then an octagonal building directly to the north of it, rather like the octagonal building directly to the north of the Temple of Solomon, as it's known in Jerusalem. So you have this association of the Templars with the very heart of the cathedral. Now I want to finish off with a rather amazing piece of research by someone called John Michel. Now he made a rather amazing discovery in the 70s about, I suppose you could say, a certain symbolic journey between Earth and the heavens uh, in the form of some amazing measures uh, between the Earth and the Moon. Now what John Michel's, what one of his main things was, was saying that imperial measure, so the foot, the mile, he felt that they were naturally existing systems of measure, naturally existing units of measure, rather than ones that had been humanly invented. So for instance, in the way that metric was humanly invented. Now, one of the things that he used to demonstrate that this was the case was uh, this amazing diagram that I'm gonna show you. Now, it shows this amazing concordance between the dimensions of Earth in relation to the moon, but these number patterns that you see are only there if you use the imperial mile. If you use the kilometer, you don't get anything. So we can begin with this image of a larger circle and a smaller circle. Uh, this is the size relationship of the Earth to the moon. And it's very accurately a relationship of 11 to three. So let's put these two circles into squares. And now of course we can say that the larger square has an edge of 11, the smaller square has an edge of three. Now in goes the pyramid triangle. Now the reason why this is called a pyramid triangle is because it's the cross section of a particular type of square based pyramid. And it is that same type of pyramid that is the Great Pyramid um, at Giza in Egypt. Now this pyramid triangle has a base of 11, because of course it's the same as the edge of the big square, and it has a height of seven. Now here is that triangle within the actual pyramid form itself. So you can see it's the cross section. And it's going from the mid edge uh, rather than from the actual uh, corner edge. So its baseline is 11, its height is seven. So you have this notion of, I suppose, uh, an ascent through seven steps from the square base up to the peak of the pyramid. There's seven units of height. Now, if you multiply those two numbers, 11 and seven by 40, then you get the amount of Egyptian royal cubits that are in the dimensions of the Great Pyramid. Uh, the square base of the Great Pyramid is 440 Egyptian royal cubits, and the height is 280. Now, the next thing I'm going to put in is 
another circle, and this circle will have that height of seven as the radius. Now this circle is of particular significance within the diagram because of this. A circle with a radius of seven obviously has a diameter of 14. And if we multiply 14 by pi, we can get the measurement of the circumference, which is pretty much, but not quite, 44. Now, if we use the approximation of pi, 22 divided by seven, which we know was used in the ancient world, if we use that as our approximation of pi, then 14 multiplied by 22 divided by seven equals 44 exactly. So what we can say is that that new circle that's just gone in has a radius of seven and a circumference of 44. Now, the reason why that's significant is because the moon, the Earth square, which I showed you at the beginning, the big square there, has a peripheral measurement of 11, 22, 33, 44. So this is an example of the squaring of the circle. The circle has the same peripheral measurement as the square. So this type of pyramid has a significance of that sort anyway, even before you begin to look at uh, the Great Pyramids in Egypt, just the pure mathematics of that type of pyramid are significant already. Now what you're looking at here is directly up at a ceiling within uh, one of the towers in the cathedral um, here at Wells. Uh, this is uh, obviously that's a wooden plug, a, a modern wooden plug that's been put in to seal up the hole because this is actually where the bell ropes would hang down through this hole. Now if you look at those foliate forms that are going around the circumference there, you can see the sort of leaf shapes. If you count how many of them there are, there's 44. So they're using this type of geometry in Wales Cathedral because they have a circumference of 44. Now the way to uh, develop a, a circumference of 44 is to have a radius of seven with say a piece of string. If you use a piece of string to draw a circle and you have seven units on that string, you can then wrap the string around the circumference and mark off seven units each time until you get to six times seven, 42, and then you have two more units giving you 44. Now, remaining in the same era as Gothic cathedrals, but uh, looking again at Germany at one of the uh, uh, Hildegard of Bingen's illuminations again, this one is called Das Feltor, which means the universe, the all. And you see how there are these um, seven red stars which are going up in a line, or six red stars rather, with the moon below them. Now, what she describes in this image is that they're the seven planetary spheres. So first you have the moon just above Earth, and then you have the two smaller stars, which would be Mercury and Venus. And then you have the sun, which is a larger one, and then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, going off out of the frame there. So you have those seven, rather like the radius of seven that you have in a circle. Now, if you then look within the cosmic egg, you've got those yellow stars, and there's 44 of them. So you have seven and 44, as you have within that circle that's used within the pyramid geometry. Now on top of that, if you look at the dimensions of this image itself, you can say that it's five and a half along the short edge and seven along the long edge. So if we think of this as being five and a half, then you could say that there'd be another five and a half here, and that would give you 11 if you did that. And then you'd have the height of seven as the pyramid triangle. So therefore this diagonal line here is essentially the slant of a pyramid triangle and that would be the baseline and the height. Now I'll fade in an image of uh, the pyramid geometry very slowly so you can see uh, how it accords with this particular type of rectangle. So you see how the pyramid triangle is touching the top edge and going to the two middle points on either side. So Hildegard of Bingen is using this type of geometry and cosmology as well. Now keep your eyes closely on that pyramid triangle, and I'll fade in another image. Now, there is no definitive way of drawing uh, the Sri Yantra, but most of them do have uh, a pyramid triangle as the largest upward pointing triangle. And you also have the association of the number 44 with the Sri Yantra because there are 43 uh, colored 
triangles in this, this image here, those colored triangles there, there are 43 of them. And then the Bindu at the center, it seems being the 44th. So 44 comes in with this image that uses the pyramid geometry as well. Now, what you're looking at here in this stone, this is a, a geometric image, which is a depiction of the moon goddess Tanit. She was uh, the matron deity of Carthage in North Africa. Now, bearing in mind that she is a moon goddess, of course, it's interesting when you see how similar this symbol is to this diagram that uh, was devised by John Michel in the 1970s. Now, of course, John Michel will be the first person to say that he rediscovered this pattern. He wouldn't say he invented it. He said that he just found it, but he would say clearly that it was something that was used in the ancient world. Now, returning back to this diagram, another thing that John Michel showed about it is that you can put three, four, five Pythagorean triangles in like so. So the three is there by the moon, and of course the number of the moon is three. The four is there by the earth square, and of course four is the number of the earth, and then you have the five to create the whole triangle. Now at this point, we can start to look at the actual mileage of the earth and the moon, and this is where the concordances really take on uh, something even more amazing. The mean radius of the Earth is 3,960 miles. So that's, of course, that distance there. The radius of the Moon is 1,080 miles. So what we can say is that these two numbers added together would give this uh, line of seven units here. Now together they make 5,040. Now the number 5,040 is a really significant number in the philosophy of Plato. Uh, in Plato's Laws dialogue, which is the final one that he wrote, he talks about the number 5040. And now let us proceed to legislate with a view to perfecting the form and outline of our state. The number of our citizens shall be 5,040. This will be a convenient number. Let the whole number be first divided into two parts and then into three. And the number is further capable of being divided into four or five parts or any number of parts up to 10. The number 5,040 can be divided by exactly 59 divisors, and 10 of these proceed without interval from one to 10. So this number 5,040 is a very significant number in arithmetic terms, even before you use it for any sort of measure. Now here, as you can see, the, and it's actually, the, he says 59 divisors because he doesn't include the very first one but there are these 60 different ways of dividing the number up. So it becomes a versatile number in the organization of a society that's made up of 5,040 people. But this number 5,040 also has a very particular relationship with the number seven. Now, of course, the reason why this is significant is because that number seven, the seven unit height of the pyramid triangle would also be 5,040 miles if we talk about it in terms of that mileage. Now, if you look at factorial counting, so beginning from one, one times two times three times four times five and so on, if you have seven as your polar number within the decads, the first 10 numbers, as you can see with those highlighted numbers there, if you go one times two times three times four times five times six times seven, you get 5,040, but also if you do seven times eight times nine times 10, you also get 5,040. So seven is this mean number within the first 10 numbers. And these were, of course, the first 10 numbers was the focal interest of the Pythagoreans. Now, if you have six, for instance, as your polar number, if you look at the one before, if you go from one to six, you have 720, small number, and then from six to 10, 30,240, huge number. So there is this very particular mean quality that seven has within the first 10 numbers. And so how amazing that you have seven and 5,040 together 
in the same diagram with the Earth and the Moon. So I've shown you how the height to the base of the pyramid triangle is 7 to 11. And in terms of mileage, the height of the pyramid triangle is 5,040, whereas the baseline is 7,920. And that's the amount of miles in the mean diameter of Earth. Now, I just showed you a few seconds ago how the first seven numbers lead to 5,040. So let's get rid of the, the first seven numbers from here. And we're left with 8, 9, 10, and 11. Now, if we multiply those four numbers together, rather amazingly, we get 7,920. So as you can see, all of this arithmetic is amazing in and of itself, regardless of whether you apply it to Earth and the Moon or to the Great Pyramids. But it does also seem to be there with the Earth and the Moon, if you use a mile. And also, very, for various reasons, I can't go into too much detail now, but you can see it clearly there with the Great Pyramid as well. Now, one last thing that I'll show, shows how the platonic solids also fits in with this whole numerical schema. Now, you might be aware the, the five platonic solids, Plato talks about them in his Timaeus dialogue. They're the five most primary three-dimensional shapes. There's only five ways of dividing the periphery of a sphere so that you have the same shape repeated. And these are those five. Now, what Plato does is to associate four of them with the four elements uh, the four earthly elements, and the fifth one, the dodecahedron, he associates with the wider cosmos. So we're only looking at the earth here, so I'm only going to look at the four platonic solids um, that symbolize the four earthly elements. Now, as you can see, if you look closely, three of them are formed of equilateral triangles, whereas the fourth one, the cube, is of course formed of squares. Now, an equilateral triangle, as you'll probably be aware, is made up of three uh, angles of 60 degrees. So you could say that there's 180 degrees in an equilateral triangle. Whereas a square, the four uh, corners of a square, each one is 90 degrees. And so you have 360 degrees within a square. Now, what would happen if we added up all of the degrees in all of the angles in all of the shapes on those four platonic solids? So basically all of the degrees in the platonic solids. The tetrahedron has, of course, has got four equilateral triangles, so that would be 720 degrees. The hexahedron, or the cube, that's six square faces, so that's going to be 2,160 degrees. The octahedron has eight triangles, so there's 1,440 degrees. And finally, the icosahedron, which has 20 triangular faces, that has 3,600 degrees. So here are the amounts of degrees in those platonic solids, which symbolize the four elements of the Earth. Now, when we add them all up, rather amazingly, we get 7,920, which is the amount of miles in the mean diameter of Earth. And so this is why John Michel felt that the imperial mile is a naturally existing system of measure, a naturally existing unit of measure. And the foot, which is of course um, uh, a unit within the mile, he also said that they're all part of, I suppose, like a microcosmic, macrocosmic measurement system. Um, indeed, there's 5,280 feet in a mile. If you take the number 5,280 and you compare it to 7,920, they have a relationship of three to two, simple as that. So if 7,920 is three, 5,280 is two. Now, I hope you've managed to keep up with all the numbers. It's very numbersy, but I've gone as slow as I can because uh, seriously, the numbers are so amazing. I, I, I can't really not talk about them. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you, Tom, for such a wonderful presentation. Um,